Welcome to View Thunder, curated movie reviews that celebrate art, design, and cinematic storytelling. My name is Kyle, and I thank you for tuning in. From 1950 to 1955, actor James Stewart and film director Anthony Mann collaborated on eight movies together. Five westerns, two dramatic propaganda pictures, and one fantastic biopic. Let me set the table first. In the late 1930s, film actor James Stewart quickly rose to prominence as a legitimate movie star, even winning an Academy Award for Best Actor in 1940 for his role in The Philadelphia Story. But when the United States entered into the Second World War, Stewart was one of the first Hollywood actors to put his successful career on hold in order to serve his country. Having previous experience as a pilot, he enlisted in the Army Air Corps, where he trained other pilots and eventually flew several B-24 bombing missions of his own. He didn't make any new commercial films during his four years of enlistment, and upon returning to civilian life, was a changed man, unsure if he would continue as an actor. Lucky for us, he did, and his first post-war film happened to be Frank Capra's classic, it's a Wonderful Life. The film was critically lauded, but only a moderate success, and Stewart's other films throughout the late 1940s were an uneven series of hits and misses for him as well. He was frustrated by the roles he was getting, while also struggling with severe self-esteem issues surrounding his talent and abilities. In the 1930s and post-war 40s, Stewart had almost always portrayed dapper, upstanding, mild-mannered, and optimistic characters who were driven to verbal defense, not violence. He grew tired and restless in the roles he was getting. Then, in 1950, he was cast in his first Western since 1939, and the change of genre brought with it an angrier, harder-edged Stewart like we had never seen him before. Within this same time frame, Anthony Mann, who had worked his way up the ladder from theater to talent scout to assistant director, made his directorial debut film in 1942, Dr. Broadway. Throughout the 40s, Mann made several pictures that quickly came and went. He found success late in the decade with a string of well-received and profitable crime film noirs, but he still hadn't hit his stride. His luck was about to change. Stewart's deal for his Western film included a percentage of the profits, as well as the choice of director. When the original director, Fritz Lang, left the project, Stewart turned to someone he had worked with during his stage work in the 1930s, Anthony Mann. Winchester, 73, 1950. Stewart is magnetic as Lynn McAdam, who rides into Dodge City hunting down outlawed Dutch Henry Brown, a man he has some serious history with, and writers Borden Chase and Robert L. Richards wisely stay tight-lipped on the truth right up to the very end. Dutch Henry is in town all right, but Marshal Wyatt Earp is there to keep the peace between them. During a 4th of July shooting competition, McAdams' uncanny marksmanship wins him first prize, a rare, one in a thousand, Winchester model 73 rifle. But the newly won carbine is soon violently stolen from him by Dutch Henry, and the race for retribution is on, with the eponymous rifle changing hands many times throughout the adventure. I had never seen Stewart in any westerns prior to this, and he brings an angry grit and aggression to his character that is shocking. In one scene, he takes a gunslinger's gun hand, twists it around, slams the dude face down onto the bar, and holds him there for an uncompromising interrogation. The look on McAdams' face is pure, unbridled rage. In a genre filled with greats, this is one of the very best of classic westerns, and it has it all. Great characters, moral ambiguity, heroes, cowards, the strong-willed pretty girl, exciting gunplay, dark humor, an Indian attack, and a bank robbery. Best of all, it features an expertly staged and thrilling climactic gunfight, rifle to rifle amongst the high desert rocks, with bullet ricochets used to strategic effect. The great cast includes Dan Daria, Shelley Winters, Stephen McNally, Millard Mitchell, and J.C. Flippin. Keep your eyes open for an unknown at the time Tony Curtis. It is also notable as the only black and white film that Stuart and Mann made together in this lineup. The cinematography by William H. Daniels on location is excellent. The movie was a huge hit and ushered in a new era of success for both the star and the director. Bend of the River, 1952. A couple years later, they followed up Winchester 73 with Bend of the River. The story centers on a group of 1866 settlers who have traversed west to make a home for themselves in Oregon, with Stewart's Glenn McClintock as their trail guide. Early on, McClintock rescues a man, Emerson Cole, played to shady effect by Arthur Kennedy, from a lynching followed by a nighttime Indian attack that showcases McClintock's wet work in dispatching the attackers in the dark. When the group arrives in Portland, they make a deal for their provisions of food to be delivered upriver, 
but months later, with winter fast approaching, the food has yet to arrive, and a race against time and treachery ensues. This second film from Stuart and Mann is pretty good, but I found it a bit of a stumble from the previous western. I enjoyed the gorgeous location photography by Irving Glassberg, but overall, the story and characters really didn't do much for me. That's not to say the cast doesn't cut it. Stuart, Kennedy, and Julia Adams, a year before her star-making turn in Creature from the Black Lagoon, are perfectly capable in their parts. I just wasn't enamored with the story being told. Still, this is a decent film that has some great moments and solid performances from everyone, including another appearance by J.C. Flippin. I think most folks will enjoy this one. It was another big box office success and still popular today. So I'm definitely in the minority on this one. The Naked Spur, 1953. It's 1868, and Stewart, as Howard Kemp, is tracking a man through the Colorado mountains who is wanted for killing a sheriff in Texas. With the promise of 20 bucks, he enlists an old prospector named Jesse, played by a returning Millard Mitchell, to help him apprehend the outlaw. The two of them go on the hunt and soon run into a U.S. cavalry officer played by Ralph Meeker, but it doesn't take the three of them long to track down the duplicitous Ben Vandergoat and his beautiful companion Lena, wonderfully portrayed respectively by Robert Ryan and Janet Lee. Capturing Vandergoat so early in the story is an inspired choice, as the narrative then turns to covering the group's arduous journey to bring the outlaw in for a reward and the interpersonal warfare between the characters vying for their fair share of it, all while the outlaw takes advantage of the situation in his attempt to escape. The film climaxes with a gun battle next to a raging river which involves some really cool daring stunt work. Another incredible on-location setting with beautiful wilderness vistas captured by director of photography William C. Meller, an exciting score by Bronislaw Caper, and fantastic character moments. There are only five speaking parts here, which gives the small ensemble of players plenty of room to inhabit their characters, and every one of them really brings it. My only real quibble with this film, which of course is just my opinion, is the very last scene, which I won't spoil for you, but it involves a character's choice to not do something that I found a bit silly. It's presented as the morally right choice, but I'm watching this going, what, really? What does it matter now? But hey, it's still a great flick. Thunder Bay, 1953. Now, if the premise of fossil fuels being a good thing sticks in your craw, then you might wanna skip this one. There is definitely some propaganda going on here. Personally, that aspect of the story doesn't bother me in the slightest, and Stewart delivers a great monologue later in the film stating that without oil, America would come to a halt and die. 71 years later, He's not wrong. However, the movie as a movie is kind of lacking in dramatic lift, but not without really working for it. We're introduced to Stuart and a welcome return by Dan Daria, playing down on their luck engineers. They arrive in a Gulf Coast shrimping town where they hope to pitch their revolutionary offshore oil platform idea to a wealthy investor, played by a now regular J.C. Flippin. Writers George W. George and George F. Slavin pull out all the stops in an attempt to create some compelling drama. Angry locals who want big oil out of their small town, the beautiful Joanna Drew playing a jaded woman who has, of course, been hurt by men before, a father angry that his young daughter has fallen for a dirty roughneck, and even sabotage. But none of this can hide the message behind it all. That being said, the picture features Stuart, Daria, and Drew leading a superb cast, including Gilbert Rowland as local shrimp boat captain Tesh Bossier. Rowland gives a standout performance here, delivering the strongest character arc of the film. In addition, the on-location photography by returning DP William H. Daniels and Mann's expert direction makes this movie worth watching. The highlight being a nighttime set piece featuring a fight on board the oil platform during a severe storm. An interesting production note here is that the film was originally shot in a full frame 137 aspect ratio, but the studio decided later that they wanted it widescreen, which was pretty typical of the era. So they faked it by cropping the top and bottom of the image for a 185 theatrical release. This is only a problem if compositionally the film was designed for the full frame, which it was. You'll notice several shots throughout the film where key visual storytelling is awkwardly placed or cropped out completely. At one point, Stuart is working on a model to demonstrate the oil rig, and it's just barely in frame at the bottom edge of the screen. Later on, there is a bomb with a lit fuse that is supposed to build tension as the fuse shortens, but the burning fuse is completely out of frame. Hopefully the original camera negative has survived so that maybe someday a restoration could reveal the entire original framing. I for one would like to see that. And speaking of cutoff, 
That brings part one of my James Stewart, Anthony Mann retrospective to a close for this episode of View Thunder. I hope you'll join me in part two, which includes another excellent Western, but also a bit of Cold War propaganda. Thank you for tuning in. If you enjoyed these reviews, I'd appreciate you hitting those like and subscribe buttons. And until next time, remember to always stay for the end credits.